Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figure It Out Productions. The following video is part of our quick shoot series. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and welcome to part five, not ten, five, of my uh, fifth generation uh, retrospective series. If you haven't seen, part one is about the generation as a whole, part two is about the Commodore Amiga CD32, part three about the 3DO, part four about the Atari Jaguar, and part five, the Sega Saturn. Now, like a lot of you, probably most of you, I typically mentally, nostalgically define the fifth generation as the PlayStation and the N64, right? I'm sure you do too. But I felt it was very important to acknowledge all of the consoles in the fifth generation that had come before. It's a technicality, but they were there. The Sega Saturn is very unique in that it was official. It was very much a part of that generation, and yet is a complete dark horse. You know, of all the mainstream ones, this is the one that no one knows anything about. No one owns it, no one ever talks about it, no one ever remembers it. As I've said quite a few times in this series, the fifth generation was all about all these different companies saying, hey, you know what? Sega just proved that you don't have to be named Nintendo to make video game hardware and be successful. So naturally, Sega, who is the one who had proved that, said, of course we're making another console. So why is it that this console ended up being so obscure? So I thought on it, I did some research, and I kind of, this is my general conclusion. Sega was run by fucking idiots. I love Sega, I love them to death, but they were run by morons. The thing is, Sega always had horrible internal communication, and their hardware policies were very, very bizarre. See, Nintendo's policy generally was we make a console, we stick to it for a long time, then we move on. Sega's hardware policy was, well, I don't know, make something, we'll put it on the market, we'll see what happens, yeah! Oh, it didn't work? Fuck it, drop it, we'll make a new one, yeah! That was how Sega always operated. Obviously, it ultimately killed them, but we have to look at some of their the predecessors before this. Okay, so, so they released the Mega Drive. Now, the Mega Drive, aka Sega Genesis as we know it, uh, explosion of success in North America. Easily Sega's most popular console here. Uh, it did very, very well in South America, it did very, very well in Europe, but here's something you probably don't know. It did very, very badly in Japan. Uh, Alright, badly might be a harsh word, but it didn't do well. I think it actually came in third. Its competition, of course, being the Super Nintendo and the PC Engine. We know it as the TurboGrafx-16. Now, they said, okay, we're going to move on, we're going to make this new thing. And Sega of America and Sega of Europe weren't quite ready to do that because, of course, the Genesis was still very popular. So much so that Sega of America basically boycotted the Saturn and said, you know what, no, we're not doing that. We're going to make the 32X. We're going to release this thing that goes on top of the Genesis because the Genesis is so popular. It would be insane for us to just move on at this point when we have a, a giant gargantuan hit. Had they been able to stick with it, it might have done better, we don't know. But Sega of Japan, which is the headquarters of Sega, ultimately told North America, you can't do that. You, we can't have competing hardware like this. Drop the 32X, get rid of that thing, we're not going to make games for the Saturn and port them to our competing hardware. It doesn't make any sense. So, they, ultimately they had no choice. So Sega of America eventually decides, okay, fine, we have to release a Saturn, and of course Sega of Europe followed suit. This is what the, Jap the uh, Sega Saturn looked like when it first came out. It's this cool, gray-looking design, very, very neat, with these blue buttons. It's really cool. It's got the access light. Now, th this was the model, the model 1, as we think of it. Now, it was eventually, uh, when they, re they repainted it for North America, and uh, it looked like this. A solid black design, but it had the oval buttons. And... Uh, the way they launched this in North America was one of the stupidest launches in gaming history. Now, to understand why this is so stupid, you have to remember that, again, this console came out in 1994, the first version of it. They were still of the mindset that the future of the fifth generation was going to be 2D games with 3D backgrounds. That was the intention. Ultimately, that was obviously not the case, because the PlayStation and the N64 proved that, you know, we're going to focus more on 3D intensive games. The Saturn was not built for that. So, when the PlayStation was about to drop in Japan, Sega had a little bit of time before the release of the Saturn. They kind of reevaluated it and said, like, wow, the thing that Sony is putting out, the thing that Nintendo is probably going to put out, is going to kick the shit out of us as far as hardware goes. We have to do something to fix this. Sega of Japan basically panicked and said, what can we do to make the Saturn a little bit more future-proofed? 
So the last minute thing they threw in was a second processor. Having absolutely no idea how to utilize it. No developer had any idea how to utilize the second processor at that point. But they thought if it's there, someone will figure that out and we will be able to take advantage of it. Though most games never even tried. Most of the time the processor just sat there doing nothing. And unfortunately because the console wasn't around for that long, relatively, in, at least in North America, we don't know. We don't know its fullest potential. Um, there was, obviously, Shenmue was planned originally for the Saturn. That game, if you look at the tech demo footage of it, wow, it's hard to believe that was actually going to be on the Saturn. That might have been the game that would have pushed it to its fullest, but we don't know, because we will, obviously that version has never leaked or anything, so we don't really know. So ultimately what you have is this 2D powerhouse console that's capable of 3D rendering that now everybody is forced really quickly to try and make 3D games for because Sega saw the writing on the wall. They saw what was coming. They knew the PlayStation and the N64, or what it would ultimately be, the N64, were going to push these types of things. So they had to tell developers, sorry, but you're going to have to start to work with this. Now again, they were Sega, so they had a lot of power behind their name. But while Sega of Japan was able to make that shit work, Sega of America and Sega of Europe, not so much. See, going back to what I was saying about the North American launch, it is the most botched launch in console history, as far as I'm concerned. It's unprecedented how bizarre this launch was. So in E3 of 1995, uh, Sega of North America has their pre big presentation, unveiling the Saturn. This is the Saturn, blah, 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 trying to get everybody all psyched up and everything. And their final move was to be like, oh, you just like the Saturn, oh, that's great. Oh, by the way, it's on the store shelves already. You can go out right now and buy it. They had jumped the launch date to the summer of 1995. Now the reason that's bad is because people aren't typically motivated to buy new big electronics in the summer. That typically, studies show that people really like to do that shit in like November, obviously, because Christmas is right around the corner. The holidays are there. Everyone wants to buy stuff. That's when people are willing to open their wallets. They don't want to do that in the middle of the summer. It launched at $399 US. That's somewhere around like $600 today. Uh, the other thing was that it pissed off developers big time. Even Sega's internal development teams were uh, really pissed. Again, horrible internal communication in that company. Basically, what they told everybody is like, get your games ready for uh, a November release of 1995. And then in May, they were like, oh, by the way, have your game turned in next week. This is, so you got a couple of famous examples of launch games that were not ready. Uh, Virtua Fighter and uh, Daytona USA are the two most famous ones because ultimately they had re-releases called Virtua Fighter Remix and Daytona USA Championship Edition were basically just re-releases to fix all the bugs and complete the game. Yeah, they pissed off a lot of developers doing that. And they pissed off a lot of, uh, non, not just internal ones, but a lot of third-party ones who were like, this console is a fucking nightmare to program for. Nobody was buying it. And so developers didn't have a whole lot of motivation to actually develop games for it. But the reason they jumped the date like that is because the PlayStation was going to come out only a few months later and they were like, you know, if we build up an install base, maybe we can override any possible uh, threat that the PlayStation might have to us. Because they legitimately felt threatened by the PlayStation, and rightfully so, because obviously it won. But uh, they just wanted to, their only goal at that point was to build an install base and hope for the best. And uh, unfortunately for them, the PlayStation ended up selling about as many consoles in the first few weeks that the uh, Saturn sold collectively in that entire like month, few months span. So it really didn't end up working out at all for them, which is really unfortunate. Now, I, I, they have a sad history there. They really do. And unfortunately, we reached a point only two years later in 1997 where uh, former uh, president of Sega of America, Bernie Stoller, who is who said one of the dumbest things, it's still up there, it's still ranked as like one of the top 10 stupidest things ever uttered in the video game industry, or ever done in the video game industry. Uh, he was asked about the Sega Saturn, and like what their plans for it and all that stuff were, and he just gave an unbelievably honest and yet fucking retarded answer. He just said, the Saturn is not our future. He told the whole world like, yeah, don't buy a Saturn. It's, we're, not, we're not sticking with that, that's, that's, that's over. Sega of America had no faith in that console, but you're not supposed to tell people that. You're supposed to keep, you know, trying and making the thing work. Because at that point, when you hear that, you go, why the fuck am I going to buy a Saturn then? If, why would I put any money down? Why would I do that? And of course, everybody who bought a Saturn was like, wait, 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 wait. You're telling me you're done with this console already? It's been two years. Why the, what the fuck? You know, and people were pissed off, and you can't blame them. A lot of developers said, fuck it, I'm out. They bailed on Sega at that point. And the most infamous example 
ultimately would prove to be EA, who said, you know what, they were so pissed about that that they said, we are completely done with you, Sega. And as a result, a lot of the developers jumped ship from Sega over to Sony, and they also refused to work on the Dreamcast. It was one of the dumbest things that has ever happened in the history of video games. And another interesting tidbit about it, Sega, believe it or not, really didn't have a console for 1998. You know, the Saturn obviously was still there, and it was trickling out a few more sports games and stuff, but that's about it. And then in late 1998, Sega of Japan launched the Dreamcast. But for most of 1998, they didn't have a game console. Now, that might be part of the reason that a lot of us don't really think about the Saturn when it comes to the fifth generation. It might also be the reason that I had never even heard of this game console, ever, until part of the way through the Dreamcast lifespan. But that's not to say that this wasn't a great, great game console. It actually has a lot of hidden gems on it. I can't recommend it enough. There's so much great stuff that actually managed to come out in its time. There's a lot of shovelware, admittedly, but that's true of all Sega stuff, to be honest with you. There's a lot of hidden gems that were just never advertised very well. Sega's marketing was always shit. They never knew how to present anything, but they had made some phenomenal stuff. And just interesting and unique stuff, and I want to talk about some of that stuff. Now, you'll notice this cartridge port on the back here, right? Because you see all these cards sticking out of it. The origin of this port it was actually that Sega of America and Sega of Europe really begged Sega of Japan to make that a Genesis port. Ultimately, Sega of Japan said they, they decided not to go ahead with that feature because they didn't want to think it was a Sega CDX. Now, the port's interesting because it's, it, it serves a lot of functionality because it's a direct access to the motherboard. It's the only cartridge or CD console that I think does that. Uh, and what the advantage of that is, is that it allows you to save your games onto it. Like, it, it functions primarily as a memory card. But you can also do things like this. This is Action Replay, which allows you to do cheat functionality, which is actually uh, like the Game Shark here. This is, I believe, the first console to have a Game Shark. Although, if you have this, never ever use it. This Game Shark uh, has thick pins on it, and they actually stretch out and basically damage the cartridge port, so never use this if you actually have it. Um, but this also allows for imports. Uh, if you have this card in there, your Saturn will become region-free just by doing that. Uh, it also allowed you to add more RAM to the console, like this. This is actually a 4 megabyte RAM cartridge, which I know seems laughable now, but it actually is quite useful in a lot of games that would take advantage of it. Uh, it also has the uh, capability, although it's only been tested in the last couple of years because the Saturn keeps surprising us, uh, because it has direct access to the motherboard, it is theoretically possible to make an EverDrive for this thing. Now, an EverDrive is a line of flashcards uh, for various cartridge consoles. You know, you load an SD card onto the, uh, the cartridge, put the cartridge into the console, and it's got ROMs for every single game ever made. Now, that's not really possible with CD consoles because obviously they don't use cartridges, but the Saturn is an exception because of this. It's been proven that that is possible, at least with one game at a time. It's possible they could load multiple ISOs onto an SD card at some point and do that. Don't, I'm not saying it's in development, I just know there have been other little versions of it, and that project may expand, who knows. But other things we got, this is the biggest surprise that most people have never know about. So much lost potential. This is the Netlink. Now what this is, is actually a modem. Yes, you could play the Saturn online in 1996. Yeah, there were games that supported this, not too many, admittedly, but if you had one, and your friend had one, you both had a Netlink, you could just connect via online, and you could play each other. You didn't even have to go to each other's house. They had online multiplayer in 1996 on this thing. Damn, son. <laughs> like, that's impressive. So the Saturn had a lot of potential, including, I did a video on this a while ago. This is the VCD uh, uh, decoder slash photo CD decoder. What this was was actually a uh, function, uh, a card only released in Japan and apparently Europe that uh, you could pop into the expansion port on the back of the console right here. And if you did that, uh, you could play VCDs on the console, and if you had the operating software, you could do all sorts of like photo things. But in addition to that, there were some games, only in Japan of course, that took advantage of this additional hardware and had unbelievably good video quality as a result. Again, I did an entire video on that if you're, you're curious about that functionality. But speaking of this port, uh, you'll notice there's a battery in there. Now, the thing about the battery is actually that it not only saves your like clock time, you know, your setting, all that stuff, but it actually the console was interesting because they tried an approach with um, saving. Prior to these consoles, saving was never an issue because you always save directly to a cartridge, right? Okay, so what do you do with a CD? You have to save internally or have some sort of memory card. 
Sega said, why can't we do both? So you got the memory cards, but they also had internal saving based on that battery. Flash memory. Mm, nice idea, didn't really work, and the reason it didn't work is as soon as the battery dies, all your saves go with it. Not a good design. And the batteries go very, very quickly. So if you ever have a Saturn, get a memory card. Another plus about the Sega Saturn, if you're ever thinking about buying a used one, is that the lasers on them are built incredibly well, so most of the time they work. Unfortunately, it was because that laser mechanism was so expensive that they ultimately cheaped out on the Dreamcast laser. In its short lifespan, it gave us a lot of games, particularly in Japan, which we'll talk about. The North American library consists of 243 games. And it got cock-blocked in a way on a lot of games because Bernie Stoller had very particular rules uh, about what games he would and would not allow. And he did an amazing job with the Dreamcast, full props there, but a terrible fucking job with the Saturn. And as a result, there's a lot of games that are extremely rare and a lot of games that never got ported over that really should have. But uh, that's not to say there wasn't a lot of diamonds in the rough. First thing I want to address, one of the biggest problems with the Saturn which it seems like one of the weirdest problems to have, is when you think of Sega, what is the first image that comes in your head other than possibly the logo? Sonic, right? Okay. The Sega Saturn does not have a true Sonic the Hedgehog game. Yuji Naka, who is the guy who basically created Sonic, he was the leader of Sonic Team, he, they basically told him, all right, you go make some other stuff, make us some other hits. You don't have to just focus on Sonic all the time. We'll handle Sonic. And he was like, all right, whatever. So they wanted to make this game called Sonic Extreme. Now, Sonic Extreme never got released, so they tried to hold people over. Now, one of the things they released was this. This is Sonic Jam. Now, this was much more exciting back in the day, because uh, what this is is a compilation of Sonic 1, Sonic 2, Sonic 3, and Sonic and & Knuckles. It also has uh, this, like, 3D world, which was used, apparently used some elements from uh, Sonic Extreme, so you guys can kind of get a sense of what Sonic Extreme was ultimately going to be. Now it's mostly a novelty because, you know, we have a lot of compilation versions. There's a lot of play ways to play the Genesis versions of the Sonic games. But the thing that makes this still stand out, to some extent, is that the port of Sonic the Hedgehog 1 for the Genesis that's on this thing is weird. Uh, what you can do in that game that you couldn't do originally is they added the Spin Dash functionality. Now, the spin dash is where Sonic kind of curls up into a ball and then charges up and fires. That game, that function is actually not in the first game, but for the Sonic Jam version, it is, which is pretty cool. Um, in another effort to hold people over, they took the Genesis game Sonic 3D Blast and really beefed the shit out of it and made it a Saturn game. Again, just to hold you over because they're like, Sonic Extreme is telling you it's coming. Just, just wait. This will hold you over. This is a love-hate game for a lot of people. I'm kind of in that hate category. I, don't, I guess I don't really hate it. I just don't, I never really liked Sonic 3D Blast. It was just, it never interested me that much, you know? But there's a lot of people who love this game, so there it is. And then they also, the, they, the most unique one they put out was Sonic R. Now this game was exclusive for a really long time. It, it, it's a racing game where you just run as Sonic and the other characters and you race each other. A lot of people are off-put by this game when they first play it, and I don't blame them. Because the first level is incredibly wonky, and playing as Sonic is incredibly wonky. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's what most people do. They play as Sonic on the first level, and your first impression of this game is like, oh, it's unplayable, it's horrible, I don't ever play this again. And uh, what I've been told and I've experienced it myself is, really, you should play as Knuckles when you're brand new to the game, because he's a little bit easier to control. And then once you kind of get a sense of how that game works, you'll actually start to really like it. It does get a lot better, but right from the get-go, it is fucking hard and annoying. But if you play it the right way, then you'll and like it. The other thing about it that's famous is its music. Uh, they went with a very bizarre soundtrack for this game that people love and hate. That's the only two options. I'm in the love it category. I think the music in this is just so weird, and I really, really genuinely enjoy it. Um, one of my favorite features about this game, actually, is that you can just pop it in a CD player and just listen to the music. And I, I, sorry, I genuinely enjoy the music that was made on Sonic R. Now, so if Yuji Naka was not working on Sonic stuff, what was he doing? Well, one of the things he gave us was the game that the console is most famous for. Nights. Nights into Dreams. This is the reason to own that console. It is relatively common. It's not the long box version, which you see here, is not that common. Uh, more commonly, you'll see like the jewel case version. Uh, but this is definitely one to pick up if you ever get the console. It's a very uh, original type of game where you fly as this guy and you. I'm not even going to ruin it for you. You should definitely check it out. It, Knights is a pretty cool game. It also was uh, at some point bundled with uh, this 3D controller. Now take a look at that controller. Look familiar at all? Yeah, I think that might have inspired the Dreamcast controller a little bit. Who knows? 
But uh, yeah, Knights, this is definitely one to keep an eye out for. It's also one of the more affordable ones, thankfully. So definitely look into this if you ever want to get a Sega Saturn. Now one of the other games he worked on that is unfortunately not affordable at all, but actually very cool, is Burning Rangers. Now this is a game where you play as like a futuristic fire department. It's, it's actually a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's one of the games that tried its best to take advantage of Saturn's limited 3D hardware capability to try to push it to some extent, and I think it worked pretty well. Um, if you do get this, the American version, obviously very expensive and hard to find. I got very, very lucky. But um, the Japanese version, you can get that relatively cheap. Um, moving on. Now, a lot of people ask me about games they recommend, I would recommend for the Saturn. Like, what, what should I pick up on a budget? Well, like I said with that one, if you don't mind language barriers, you should often just import your games from Japan, get an action replay like this, be able to play imports. The Japanese stuff is so much cheaper just because how retardedly popular this console was over there and just how many games over there exist. Like I said, 243 in America, there was like 32 European exclusives, plus they probably had somewhere around 200 games as well. In Japan, there was 1,400 exclusives. So you add them all together, you're, you're around like 1,700 games. I mean, it was a lot of fucking games in Japan. As a result, a lot of them are much, 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 they're pennies, literally. So if you're willing to import, get past the, the, the language barrier, you, that's probably what you should do. But if you want to stick to your own region, some of the more, the, the more affordable ones I would recommend uh, is this one, for example. This is Bug. This is a cool 2D, 3D platformer. It stays on a 2D plane, but every once in a while you switch and kind of like go up onto a 3D kind of movement. And uh, it, it's one of the more common ones because Sega really pushed the shit out of this one. They really wanted to sell it. Uh, so you can generally get this for a pretty decent price. There is a sequel called Bug 2 that's not quite as common and therefore not quite as uh, affordable, but it is out there. If you enjoy this one, you could pursue that. Now, one of them I really like, but is, is not is not super affordable, is uh, this game called Astal. Now, this game did beautifully what the Saturn was intended to do, which was to be a badass 2D console with a lot of cool rendering in the background. And it's a beautiful, fantastic... 2D um, uh, platformer, and I, I really like this one. It's odd because they fucked up the label on it. It actually doesn't say the title on the, on the label. I've, I've looked multiple times on copies, and they never say it. Unfortunately, this game runs around like 40 bucks. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you can get it down for 20 or 30, but uh, not unreasonable considering what a lot of the stuff on the Saturn. But yeah, that's one to take it, uh, to, to keep an eye out for. Now, this game is pretty much unavoidable if you want to pick up a Saturn, but it's also the biggest uh, selling game on the console, period, and that's Virtua Fighter 2. I pretty much guarantee if you buy a Saturn, this game's going to come with it. It's very hard to avoid. Interesting truth about me, I'm a huge Shenmue fan, as I'm sure a lot of you know. Hell, I'm even wearing a Virtua Fighter 2 shirt right now. I actually don't like this game. I don't like any of the Virtua Fighter games. I've never enjoyed them. I love Yu Suzuki, and I love that Shenmue originated from this franchise. But I, I just never liked it. I was more of a Dead or Alive guy. I just never liked the fighting mechanics of Virtua Fighter. But, uh, you know, there it is. It's a very common one. I'm sure you can't avoid it. Uh, now, with that being said, the console was kind of... It also had a lot of third-party support. Uh, they, they did their best to get as many multi-plats as they could, again, on extremely complicated hardware. Remember, you have to think that a lot of these developers were making games for the PlayStation and so on, and they did their best to port it over, but it wasn't always necessarily the easiest thing to do. Uh, Capcom supported it. One of the games they gave us was Resident Evil. Yes, you can get the first Resident Evil game on the Sega Saturn, and it's a lot of fun on the Sega Saturn. I, I enjoy it. It's not quite as pretty as the PlayStation version, admittedly, but uh, it is nice that it exists. Uh, Resident Evil 2 was planned, but ultimately canceled in favor of the Dreamcast version, which sucks for the Saturn, but great for the Dreamcast, and since I prefer the Dreamcast, I'm not unhappy about that. But there you go, Resident Evil. Uh, now this is an interesting one, because Tomb Raider, I'm sure a lot of you are like, oh, okay, cool, I got a port of Tomb Raider. Wrong. The Tomb Raider was actually de developed and intended as a Sega Saturn release only. Uh, the guy, the, the primary uh, developer behind it, he had a lot of love for Sega. He really wanted uh, them to get this game. He actually had no real interest in the Saturn, or the, the PlayStation. And uh, so when they were making this game, ultimately, when they got down to the point where they were releasing it, they, you know, uh, IDOS more or less told them, like, you have to put it on the PlayStation. The PlayStation is doing well. You can't just put it on the Saturn. Not enough people are buying it. So he did it kind of reluctantly. So what we all think of this is this great PlayStation game. It's actually a Saturn game. And obviously his mind was convinced once the PlayStation version sold amazing and the Saturn version not so much because that's where you saw the sequels. There was no sequel. But if you want to play the version that was intended to be released, there you go. It was on the Saturn. Now another series 
that is very well known on this console, uh, but not always the most common, uh, is the Panzer Dragoon series. You got this, it's a cool on-rail shooter that has pretty much always stayed exclusive to the Saturn. I mean, the Xbox had uh, Panzer Dragoon Orta eventually, and it had some port of Panzer Dragoon 1 on it. But for the most part, these are still basically exclusive. This one, you know, there you go. This is the most common one. Uh, then, of course, you have Panzer Dragoon 2 Zwei, which is German for 2, I believe, and I'm sorry if I butchered the pronunciation of that, but there you go. Another cool sequel to that series. And then you have the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail of not only Saturn games, but perhaps video games in general. Panzer Dragoon Saga, which I keep in this nice plastic case. I got, this is a really cool um, RPG. Uh, it's not turn-based, at least as far as I got into it. I haven't beaten it by any means, but I've enjoyed what I've played of it. Uh, it's kind of an action-adventure RPG, is kind of the way I remember it. And I tried to not play it that much just because I was like, oh, it's so holy and fragile, I don't want to touch it. Um, very, very rare game. Go ahead and look it up if you don't believe me. I got insanely lucky when I picked this up. I saw a guy on eBay selling all three of them for 80 bucks as a buy it now. Did not hesitate, bought the shit out of that. And um, like I said before, there was a lot of games that only came out in Japan. And I want to show you some of my favorites, just a couple of examples. Uh, Dead or Alive, which I mentioned before, I always like Dead or Alive more. Even though, again, this is more associated with the PlayStation, Dead or Alive did come out on the Saturn, and I, I really like this version, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, Radiant Silver Gun, very cool shmup. Uh, Ikaruga, which I'm sure you've probably heard of for the Dreamcast and the GameCube, and hell, even Xbox Live Arcade. Uh, this is actually the predecessor to that. Uh, Ikaruga was the sequel, and I believe this was actually re-released on PlayStation Network and Xbox Live Arcade, but here it is, in the flesh, Sega Saturn. Uh, now, the Sega Saturn had a lot of, in Japan, had a lot of adult games, mature games, and my favorite one, because I, I only have a couple of them, just because they usually come in bundles, believe it or not, because they're very common. But this one I specifically picked up because I knew it was hilarious, is uh, the Yak Yukon Special. Now, I did a video of this on my other channel, Game Society Pimps, which I'll include a link to the video. Basically, you play rock, paper, scissors versus the computer, and the computer is just video clips of girls. And they'll, you know, they'll do this dance thing, and then they'll like, throw out you know, some sort of answer, which is either you know, rock, paper, or scissors, and you pick what you are going to throw, and if you win, they lose an article of clothing. I, it sounds very perverse, I know. That's the whole concept of a yak yukin, is basically strip, paper, scissors, rock, rock, paper, scissors, whatever you call it. And uh, they made it into a game, and it's hilarious. Now... The European exclusives, I've picked up a few of those, and I want to show you some examples. Darius 2, which is a really cool shmup. For some reason, we didn't get this. And it was in one of these horrible paper cases. Now, Sega of Europe really screwed people over by coming up with this terrible design for a case. On the outside of it is paper. This is the artwork. It is exposed at all times. It takes all the hits from people touching it, and there's no plastic layer around it. And then on top of that, the clasp system doesn't work for shit. It's, it's a terrible design. It's really unfortunate that Sega released so many of these games in these cases, but uh, nevertheless, the game itself is very good. There's also this really sweet European exclusive called Swagman. Now I got, uh, this is one of the ones that's in like, they also had these like regular style, like almost DVD cases. Um, this one uh, is sealed though, which is, it's an incredibly rare game. It's fucking awesome that I've got it. Uh, I haven't actually played it though, because of course, because it's uh, sealed, but uh, it's definitely one to keep an eye out for just because of how rare it is. Uh, but they had other exclusive games. I just wanted to show you an example of something really cool and rare. And uh, I also want to take a quick second to acknowledge uh, some of the hardware revisions, because uh, I can't believe I haven't talked about that yet. Uh, when the console came out, obviously I mentioned this is the launch Japanese one with the oval buttons and they repainted it here. But later, in Japan, which you can see, they, are, they had much more of a personality with this console. Uh, they repainted it white, they changed the way it looked, they, um, they gave it these round buttons. And it's like this pink button here for the eject. Looks very familiar, doesn't it? This was obviously the inspiration for what the Dreamcast's uh, art scheme was going to look like. Including even like you know, a bright, not a light, but, you know, a, a, obviously a different color right there at that point. Gray buttons, white body design. This is almost like the beta version of the Dreamcast, one could argue. When they brought that same body design over to North America, uh, they repainted it entirely black. When they brought it to Europe, again, repainted it black, but they kept the buttons gray, and then they made that pink button into a gray button as well. The reason I think they did that was just to reduce the, the cost of the console by dropping out the access light, which actually saved them some money. Um, so, there you go. 
I want to take another quick second here to just show you some of the controllers. Because again, when they first launched it, it had this kind of like funky controller. Um, I didn't, I don't think most people liked this one. Uh, it's got like a weird D-pad, the triggers aren't particularly responsive. These buttons are okay, and the start one's fine, but uh, Sega of Japan launched a very different style controller uh, like this that has much more responsive uh, triggers, better D-pad, and so on. And eventually Sega of America and Sega of Europe just said, all right, we'll repaint it black and bring it over here. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the history of the Sega Saturn to a certain extent. I mean, my personal experience with it was I never got to experience it. You know, like I said before, I never knew about this console when it came out. I had never heard of it. It wasn't until I was in high school where I, you know, after the Dreamcast had already, you know, been um, discontinued, where I went, I really miss Sega. I think I missed out on a lot of great experiences from them. And I was kind of in shell shock that they weren't coming back. And so one of the things I did was I looked back at their history and said, I can't believe I missed an entire console. I mean, this isn't a damn add-on. This is an entire console I had never heard of. And I never picked up, I never checked out, I never knew anyone with it. So I felt very bad about that. I felt like I was personally responsible, to some extent, for the downfall of Sega. So I wanted to do my best to try and redeem that. So I went ahead and I bought a Saturn, I got a lot of games. And over time, I've come to respect it even more for all these features that were just never utilized properly. And other games, I've only found out, like, now, wow, that was a great game. Why didn't I know about that? And I've been hunting them all down, and I'm still doing my best to complete a North American set, and hopefully I get all the uh, European exclusives, too. I am sorry to Sega that I did not support you when you probably needed our support the most. And, uh, yeah, that's unfortunate. And uh, it really, really hurt you when you went into the Dreamcast, which I tried, but, yeah. But anyway, guys... That's it. Uh, I want to thank you very much for watching uh, part five of this series. Uh, please stay tuned to part uh, six, which will be, of course, the Sony PlayStation. Probably the one most of you had, or that or the N64, that's up for debate. But uh, stay tuned for that. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you all later.